Well, today is Friday. I'm glad you can join me. I'm glad we can be together here and reading chapter 18, A Banquet from Detectives and Togas. <clears throat> I was back there. I, I, you know, we're getting tired. You know, we've been traveling around Italy for quite a while now, getting ready to come back home. And uh, I was over, I don't even know where we are right now. I was back there with that really nice looking tower and I was in the shade. Looks like it started to lean over. I didn't want it to fall on me, so I, 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 I moved up here. Uh, I'm guessing that's why everybody's around looking at it. I think they think it's going to fall over, so maybe they're waiting uh, to get a glimpse of that. I, I just moved out of the way so it wouldn't land on me. Okay, so anyway, let's go on with our story, Chapter 18, A Banquet. Um, and you remember that they picked Antonius because he had what? That's right, the, the best memory. He had the best memory, so he's going to look at the party guests and see if uh, he can remember that, and then they'll try to figure out who walked by the Temple of Minerva in order to have said that they saw that it was desecrated. Chapter 18, A Banquet. Strangely, Antonius remained away much more than an hour. His friends were fuming mad because all the time he was away, they had to sit boring themselves with Sallust, that author who does the Roman history. They looked out on the street more than they did at their books, and now and then one of them would dash outside to see whether Antonius was in sight yet. When two hours had passed, Antipas also grew uneasy and called the boys in. I had my doubts from the start about entrusting Antonius with such an important mission, he said. Probably he is lazing around the forum looking at shops. If he doesn't come back soon, you will have to go out and look for him. But no sooner had he spoken than the curtain was pulled aside and Antonius appeared in the doorway. He presented an amazing appearance. Perched askew on his head was a crushed wreath of flowers, which had slipped down over his forehead. His sandals were missing, and over his shoulder hung a man's cloak that was far too big for him. Hello, my friends, he greeted them. If you only knew what I've been through, ho, <laughs> ho, He started singing, spread out his arms, and whirled in a circle. You good-for-nothing rascal! What have you been up to? Xantippus thundered. Antonius pulled the cloak from his shoulders and held it out to Xantippus. The cloak, the chain, he stammered. Here's the chain you pulled off the burglar's neck. From the collar of the cloak dangled the golden chain the boys had found under the wardrobe. So it is, Xantippus murmured in amazement. This is it. You can even see the place where the hook was straightened out. He fixed Antonius with a questioning look. To whom does this cloak belong? Tell us, Antonius said. Xantippus frowned. What? he cried out. How did you come by tell us his cloak? It's the strangest story you ever heard, Antonius began to laugh. Did you go and see Tellus at all, Musius asked. Of course, Antonius replied. It was marvelous. I had a wonderful time. At the end, they even wanted to kill me. Tell us, tell us what happened, the boys cried at once. Where are the names? I'm sorry, where are the names, Julius asked. I don't have them. Well, they weren't listed. Xantippus was still staring at the cloak and chain, shaking his head. How do you know this is Tellus's cloak? he asked. I stole it from his bedroom, Antonius replied. How in the world did you get into Tellus's bedroom? Well, it was this way, Antonius began. Tellus had visitors. There were eight gentlemen with him. They were sprawling around the table on couches and eating. The doorman didn't want to let me in, so I gave him the letter and the ten testesterses, and then he told me to wait. He left me outside in front of the door, and I was mad because he didn't take me into the great hall. Uh, but after a few minutes later, Tellus himself came waddling toward me, the letter in his hand. He's small, fat, and bald, and there's a big scar on his head. He was wearing a golden laurel wreath and looked like Bacchus, Dionysus, right? 
right away he was nice to me as could be. He said he was so happy to meet me and asked me in. I said I was happy too and started looking for the marble wall, but Telus hurried me through so fast that I had no time to read the names. What a place he lives in. I've never seen the like of it in all my life. Everything gold and marble and pictures and rugs and hundreds of slaves. The emperor can't have any grander palace, I'm sure. Tellus took me to a big room where his guests were, and they were a bit surprised when he brought me in. He introduced me as his young friend, and then all of them acted as though they were pleased to see me. They, they were wearing wreaths of flowers, which made them look awfully funny. Tellus invited me to dine with them and said with a laugh, the dinner was planned for nine, but I guess we'll be ten for a while. At once, several slaves rushed up to me, took off my sandals, washed my feet, and stuck a wreath on my head. Tellus sat me on the middle couch as guest, guest of honor. A slave tied a napkin around me, and other slaves came with bowls and plates and gold spoons and knives, and still other slaves with the strangest food you ever saw. People laughed because I didn't know how to eat the stuff, and they explained to me what the different things were and how I was supposed to eat them. There were flamingo tongues and wine sauce, and wild boar snouts with truffles, and locusts and honey, and frogs' legs and mushrooms served in snow and awfully cold, uh, an ostrich egg omelet and antelope roast, and on top of all that, there were walnuts and apples and grapes and figs, and after, after every bite I took, a slave wiped my mouth. One slave gave me a bowl of water. I thought I was supposed to drink it, but he whispered to me that I was to dip my fingers in it. And I liked the way the different things tasted, especially the locusts. They were nice and crackly. Tellus told me he would have to discuss the letter with me later, but we never got around to that because after the meal, more wines were brought. They were all wines I've never heard of, white and yellow, heavy and light, and then some bitter stuff that was green. Tellus kept drinking to me, and I drank to him. But I can only sip the stuff, and then the men drank to me, and I did some more sipping to them. The men started telling stories, and I had to tell a funny story, too. Uh, but I couldn't think of any, so I told how we found our teacher in the wardrobe, bound and gagged. They all roared with laughter about that. Tell us most of all. Suddenly, there was music, a whole orchestra playing. It would be like a real orchestra, so there's actually an orchestra there. But I couldn't see it because I, it was behind a curtain. Flutes trilling, harps and lyres twanging, trumpets singing out and drums booming. You can kind of tell that he drank probably too much. And in between there would be a big crash as though something and somebody was smashing all the dishes and they would all play at once. Then actors came in and recited something I didn't understand because it was in Greek. I can speak and read Greek in school, but I can't understand. Dancers hopped around as though they all had stomach aches, but the clowns were awfully funny, and I roared with laughter, but then laughing made me feel sick, remember. Made me feel sick, and everything started whirling in my head, and all of a sudden, I remembered that maybe I wouldn't be able to read the names on the walls, and after that, I didn't even dare sip any more wine. Why did you leave? Flavius interrupted. I wanted to, but Tellus wouldn't let me go. Finally, I pretended that I had to go out because I was going to be sick, and then they all laughed and tell us to, and told a slave to take me out. We went into the great hall, and I, I stopped in front of the marble wall, and I, I tried to find the 20th of March, but I couldn't find it. The slave started getting impatient, so I said I wanted to write my name down. I was trying to gain time. The slave gave me a funny laugh and asked, who do you think you are? And I said, oh, don't you know I'm the guest of honor today? And he said, but you're only a little boy. And so I shouted at him, what are you thinking of? 
I am not a little boy, I'm the emperor's nephew. That scared him, and he ran off to get paint and a brush. Now I felt good because I fooled him. I found the 20th of March, but there were no names under it. The date was crossed out. Aha, Xantippus said. The feast was canceled. And how did you get away? Flavius and Caius could hardly wait to find out. I wanted to escape, Antonius continued, but I was afraid the doorkeeper wouldn't let me out. So I ran down the corridor because I saw a garden at the end of it, but there were slaves in the garden. So I ran back along the corridor, but there were more slaves coming from the other side. So I scooted into a room and closed the door. I wanted to climb out the window, but there were panes of glass in it. I heard voices on the other side of the door and thought of crawling under the bed. There was a big bed in the room, but it was too close to the floor and I couldn't squeeze under. So I hid behind a cloak hanging in a niche. I heard the slaves talking. One of them said, maybe he's in there. Another answered, you know the master has forbidden us on pain of death to enter his room without permission. What shall we do if the boy is in there? The first slave said. And the other slave said, let us lock the door and go ask our master what to do. They went away and I thought, oh boy, now I'm going to be killed for entering here without permission. It was awfully exciting. I looked out from behind the cloak and bumped my nose against the chain. I recognized it at once and thought, now I've got to get away and I've got to take this cloak with me. So I wound it good and thick around my right arm, knocked out the glass window with it, and jumped. Luckily, the window gave right on the street, and I ran like mad. Antonius came to a breathless stop uh, and stood looking at his friends like a victorious gladiator. You have done very well, Xantippus praised him. Antonius beamed. Xantippus quest looked questioningly at his pupils. Strange, he said. How did the chain come to be fastened to Tellus's cloak? You boys had it last, didn't you? You remember the chain that they took to Lucos's? Do you remember? Okay. We left it with Lucos when we ran away, Julius said. Then Tellus must have got it from Lucos, Santipus said, shaking his head in puzzlement. That means the two have dealings with each other. It also means that Lucos must have known who the owner of the chain was. Xantippus looked at the cloak uh, over. He looked the cloak over again. It is a valuable camel hair cloak, he said, unfolding it and weighing the fabric in his hand. The kind ranking officers in the Orient usually wear. The chain also comes from the Orient, as you can tell by the hieroglyphs. Tellus spent many years, I'm sorry, Tellus spent many years in the Orient. There can be no doubt that the cloak belongs to him. Then it was Tellus who broke in here and attacked you, Musius said. Xantippus raised his eyebrows. As a rule, pension generals don't usually go for burglary, he said. But this is an exception, evidently. Perhaps someone borrowed the cloak from him, Julius suggested. People do not borrow cloaks from generals, Antipas remarked. The cloak belongs to Tellus. Incredible as it seems, he is our suspect. He also sent the courier to the newspaper. And why did he suddenly call off his banquet? What can we do now, Musius asked. Xantippus pondered and did not answer. We ought to accuse him publicly from the speaker's platform in the forum, Julius said. We'll scream like the cranes of Ibicus, uh, Antonius proposed, or Ibicus. I've heard it both ways. Or we'll write on the walls, ex-consul ex ex Tellus is the murderer of Rufus Pretonius, said Publius. But Rufus hasn't been murdered, Flavius objected. No matter, said Publius, anyone in prison is as good as dead. Give me my sandals, my cloak, and my stick, Xantippus said suddenly. I know what I must do. The boys brought him his things and looked at him eagerly. I'm going to see Tellus and tell him to his face that he is an evildoer, Xantippus declared resolutely. Aren't you afraid? Flavius asked. Because Flavius is always afraid. 
Xantippus's eyes flashed. The man who desires the good must combat evil, he said grimly. And he began unwinding the bandage from his leg. Then he put on his sandals. I shall ask him why he assaulted me, why he stole my writings on Pythagoras, and my treatise on the acute angles of an obtuse triangle. I shall demand that he procure Rufus's reliefs at once and threaten, if he refuses, to publish the whole story in the newspaper tomorrow morning. That will frighten him. Politicians fear public opinion beyond all else. Come on, help me into my cloak. Musius and Julius draped the cloak around his shoulders. Antipas took up his stick and straightened like a soldier coming to attention. You wait here for me. If I am not back in two hours, inform the police. He started toward the door. Wait, Musius cried. I have just thought of something. Xantippus turned. What is it? He asked, frowning. Remember, you told us that you struggled with the man who attacked you, Musius said, the words coming out in a rush. Xantippus nodded impatiently. Well, was the fellow tall or short? Tall, why? He was at least a head taller than I am. But tell us is short, Musius said shorter than you. That's true, Antonia said. He's small and fat, and you are, you are tall and thin. Xantippus hesitate, hesitated for a moment. Then he came back into the room and sat down again. Take off my cloak, he said. After a long pause, he murmured, Tellus is short. The burglar was tall. How is that possible? A short man cannot be tall. Caius said. Xantippus said nothing. The boys also were silent. Suddenly, they heard footsteps in the classroom. Someone approached the curtain and remained standing behind it, breathing loudly. There is someone there, Flavius whispered. Someone where? Xantippus asked, startled. Someone is at the door, Musius said. Who's there? Xantippus called sternly. I am here. A gentle, deep voice replied, and an old man entered. He was dressed in rags, his bare feet covered by miserable shoes made of bark. Gravely, he looked at Xantippus and the boys and said, Greetings. Greetings, Xantippus replied. Who are you? Are you the pupils of the Xanthos school? The old man asked. My name is Xanthos, Xantippus said. I come from prison and I bring you a message from Rufus, the old man said in a slow, weary voice. The boys instantly thronged around him, all saying at once, from prison, how is Rufus? Still living, the man replied. I was fettered to him by the same chain. He raised a skinny arm and showed his wrists, bruised and swollen. I was released today. Has Rufus been released also? Musius asked softly. The old man shook his head sorrowfully. No, he is waiting to be taken to trial, but nobody is paying the least attention to him. He lay beside me on the damp stone floor. We received almost nothing to eat or drink for days, but he has never cried. He's a brave boy. Only at night have I heard him sobbing. The boys looked down at the floor. You, were you able to talk to Rufus? Xantippus asked, clearing his throat several times. Not often, the old man replied. We were closely guarded, and no one is permitted to speak. You are beaten if you say so much as a word. When the guards came and removed my chain, Rufus sat up and looked pleadingly at me, as though he wanted to say something but did not dare. Then, as I was being led out, he suddenly shouted after me, Go to the Santo school. Tell my friends they must tear the sheep's clothing off the red wolf. That was all he could say, for a guard furiously lashed out at him with a stick. I came here at once to bring you his message. Tear the sheep's clothing off the red wolf. What it means, you will know better than I. But make haste. 
it cannot be more frightful in Hades than it is in prison. Greetings. The old man bowed and left as suddenly as he had appeared. Xantippus and his pupils stared after him in perplexity. The meaning of Rufus's message was an utter mystery. We are to tear the sheep's clothing off the red wolf, Julius murmured. What was he getting at? That the red wolf is wearing sheep's clothing, Caius said. Idiot, Musius rebuked him. First, we must know who he means by the red wolf. All the boys looked hopefully at Xantippus. Do you know who the red wolf could be? Musius asked respectfully. I don't know anything about a wolf, their teacher replied. Why is the wolf red? Flavius pondered. I don't know anything about a red wolf either, Xantippus said crossly. Maybe the sheep's clothing can help us somehow, Julius suggested cautiously. The wolf in sheep's clothing is an old fable, Xantippus replied. We will be taking it up when school starts again. The boys found little consolation in this reminder. They went on speculating. The red wolf is the culprit, Julius decided. But what has that to do with Tellus, Musius said. Tellus isn't a red wolf. And Tellus is short, not tall, Caius reminded him. I can't understand why Rufus did not give us the right name, Publius said. He must know it. Be quiet, Xantippus interrupted them. We must think this through step by step. Rufus did not say the real culprit's name because he did not want the guards to understand for fear they would run and warn the criminal. That again proves that the culprit is an important personage. Rufus is still worried about his father. Not even the torments of prison would make him endanger his father's position. He must have spent a lot of time working out that message to us. The guards couldn't possibly know who he was, who was meant by the Red Wolf. But Rufus assumes we will see it immediately. Unfortunately, we cannot. And therefore, his message is of no help to us. We are in a blind alley. Let me think. It's maddening, Musius said with a sigh. And his words expressed the feelings of all the boys. It never occurred to him or to any of the others that the answer to the riddle lay right outside the window. Do you remember? Can you remember? Can you think who the red wolf could be? The boy stared at Xantippus, waiting for some inspiration from him. But now even Xantippus was stumped. It was growing darker outside, and violent gusts of wind rattled the shutters. Then it began to pour. Antonius went to the window and peered out unhappily. Suddenly he crouched down and called out in a low voice. There's Tellus, across the street. Okay, that's it for today. Did the, did the tower fall? No, not yet? Okay. Well, I'll let you know if it does. Um, the next uh, chapter is chapter 19, The Bakery. And we'll get on that uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow, on Monday when we get back. Okay, guys, take care. Have a great weekend. See you soon.